what is it that somebody is lacking other than skill? Like, why is somebody tight? Why does the body tighten up someone's pecs or tighten up someone's hips? It's a brain problem. It's, it's you know, you're, it's a central nervous system problem. When the brain feels that something is unstable, weak, normally between the muscle group, so a joint on either end, it will it won't want to go there. You know, it won't want to allow it to go there and it will just create stiffness, tightness. And it, it just doesn't feel like it's safe to go into those end ranges of motion. People argue that they're going to be stretching. Now, yeah, all right. But as we've said, this is a nervous system problem. If our body doesn't feel safe in a certain range, then stretching alone isn't going to be a thing that changes that. So I think we're... So Steve, it's been a while and I thought, there's an interesting topic here because there was a running joke you had for me for ages that I should just fucking squat. And I hadn't been squatting for so many years. And now I've started a strength program and I'm actually squatting. And while I still feel tight and locked in outside of a safety bar, I'm just kind of sucking up and getting on with it. And guess what? My squat is slowly getting better. So yeah. I thought it would be interesting to talk about mobility and where this middle ground is between getting into positions and sucking it up and working around positions. So first off, like, first off, how are you for the people that haven't had seen you on the show for a very long time? And then secondly, what is your take on what mobility is and how do you look at it when a client is limited in certain areas? Yeah, no, I'm good. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me back. Um, Always, man. I want to know what sort of stuff you're doing with your training, but you don't use it. You lose it in it. That's the way it is. You don't use it. You lose it regardless of what the issues are, what the problems are. You know what I mean? Basic. That's, that's my belief anyway. Um, obviously, unless you're coming out of surgery or some shit like that, but no, I'm good. I'm, I'm keeping well. Um, what was the other question about mobility? So when you have it with a client, what's your approach of it? What do you think, like, how, how would you, first off, how would you define it? And then how would you look at it with a client? Well, um, mobility refers to the ability, you see that, mobility, ability, to move or be moved freely, yeah, and easily. So, like, the capacity of an individual to the organism, the human, to move, whether that's walk, run, drive, swim, fly, I don't know what you want to do. You know what I mean? Movement, right? In the absence of constraints that may hinder or limit the movement. So, you know what I mean? Mobility, stability, that's what we'll go into today. How I approach it with a client, athlete, as always, it depends on what they need to achieve, right? Whether it's a 60, 80-year-old bloke who just needs to walk better because he's so hunched over and his stride is so short, he can't move. Okay, we've got to build the mobility so that he can function for life better, you know, and then we work it out. Or whether it's a swimmer who knew, needs crazy levels of mobility in his shoulders and elbows so that he can produce more power in the water, right? Because excessive mobility helps swimmers move better and create more power in the water. So it depends on, depending on what they want, right? Um, I I think that's yeah. the key thing, though. I think that's the key thing. With like, is it, it is dependent because it's like we you, we spoke of there about your business, right? And you're in the position where you're making more money than you have done, and you're managed to work four days, and it's still this. Well, what am I doing with my time? It's almost because we haven't set the expectations of what success is. There's always something, and I think people do the same thing when they're looking at being more mobile. It's just more mobile, more mobile, more mobile, more stable, more stable, more stable. And the way I look at it is like you have mobility on one end of that spectrum and stability on the other end of the spectrum. Mobility, movement at a joint, so sort of passive in a way range, right? We'll come back to active range in a second. That if the more mobile you are, the less stable you are. People that are super mobile tend to be more prone to injuries. On the flip side of that, if you take the power lifter, who is super, 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 super stable, barely ever gets injured, but goes in a very small sagittal plane range yeah. of motion. So where you fall on that spectrum depends on where you want to be. Some people are like, it's okay maybe if you can't get your leg behind your head because you're a prop forward in rugby that needs to be able to sort of get yeah. tackled, get hit, do a scrum. Yeah. So like yeah. maybe put that goal to the side because it's not as important. Yeah. And if people get lost in this more is better approach to mobility at all times and actually could be hindering you. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree totally. Again, it's what's adequate for performing what you want to achieve. So again, it's 
goal dependent, activity dependent. You know what I mean? There's a big difference between how rigid, stiff, stable and mobile a powerlifter needs to be at one side of the spectrum compared to a, a, a gymnast, you know what I mean? A, a performing gymnast, you know what I mean? We all know they need to be very stable, but more mobile than powerlifter, innit? So yeah, you're right. It, it's a continuum, innit? Would you and consider the Olympic about- lifter the middle of that spectrum? Because they'll have to be able to snatch, good overhead. They have to have good amounts of overhead range, extension. They need to have good thoracic mobility. Yeah. Like, is that, but if they go too mobile, well, they've got to be super, because they get to do heavy loads. Would you think Olympic yeah. lifters, like, right bang in the middle? I don't know. Like, that, that's, a, that's a really good question. And that's very thought provoking because, like, my experience with knowing and seeing weightlifting, I would, say that the i mean listen the elite level and the best weightlifters no doubt genetically they're gifted with superior mobility whether that that's joint anatomy and just natural levels of mobility all right but at the same time shit they need to be stable man but i don't know if they're in the middle though i would put them at the highest level of the elite you know good performers the mobility side yeah, that's what I, that's what I would say. That's what I would think. What what do you think about that? Would you put them in the middle? Yeah, maybe. Like, cause it, it's it like you obviously if they're too, if they're too mobile, they're not going to have stability at these end ranges to catch a bar and not hurt themselves. Mm. But at the same time, it's a pretty big range of motion that you're going to need to go through. But you're not going through such a range of motion. That you're going through the splits either, or you know, doing these back bends or something like this, you know, it is, yeah, I probably would somewhere around the middle, maybe slightly more towards the stability side of it. Um, mm. But like yeah. center right, but not, you know, not much further than that. Um, yeah. But like, look, at, so, so looking at this as well, like, I think your, your term use or lose it's a big thing. And I think that showcases the differences between us two. I think, again, and I've said this before, though I, I, I think I've in some way genetically been giving a somewhat bad hand. Like, I think the Scottish deep hip sockets do not help my squatting, and it's always going to be a thing. I, I, I think I've mouth breathed ever since I was a kid, so my rib cage and scaps haven't moved any very, near very well. Yeah. But if you put that aside, or whether the, there's a genetic difference between us two, for sake of arm, because you have, for, for what you do, decent, got a good strict overhead press, good squat, good deadlift. In the time where I delved a little bit too down the RTS wormhole, which I'm glad I did because I've learned loads that actually will help me help clients get more mobile now. But I think the problem is the danger is the danger in knowing a little bit. And the people that taught me knew a little bit. And the people, I, me, I knew even less. So when I was going through these things, I stopped squatting because I was told, this isn't good for you. You're not built for that. You haven't got the active range to do that squat. Don't do it. So while that may have been good advice for that very moment, no one really had the progression plan in mind to get me back to a squatting pattern as quickly as possible, which means I lost that. And I think it's because progressions and regressions, and that's maybe another topic for another day, is one of the most complicated topics in the world. Because there's no such thing that really fits into this lovely, that's a progression from this. It's different. You really have to have a coaching eye for it. So I think I, I got stiffer and stiffer and stiffer of working with what I currently have, never ever going to what was my capabilities. And you continued doing the patterns and got good and got rehearsed. And now I think I'm just now going into that again. I'm going like, right, let's try and unlearn some of this and see where, where my limitations actually are. Yeah. Interesting. I, I do like, you know, uh, you, know, you know, like the continuum of stability and mobility. It's all about finding a balance between the two, right? As we've already mm-hmm. said, that's optimal for the movement and the function that you want to achieve. Right. And I think a big part of that is to understand that different joints require different levels of each. So, you know, like mobile joints, and then you have more stable joints, right? If you if you look at the the two most mobile joints in the body, the shoulder and the hip, right? High degrees of mobility for large ranges ranges of motion, right? And now, if you don't have that, there's going to be problems, all right? Stable joints, you know, for a foundation for movement to occur from. So, stable joints, maybe 
the elbow, the knee, um, you know, the upper neck up here, the cervical part of the, the spine, stable joints. I think if you don't have a certain amount of mob mobility and stability in certain areas, that's when you're going to lead. That's when you're going to get injured. You know what I mean? And um, but then again, genetics plays a plays a role in it. Like you're saying with your hips and stuff. You know what I mean? So like, it's 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 a funny one because you know what? I've never had good hip mobility. Never, never had good hip mobility. And when I was on my masters, right of sports science a few years ago, I had the um, the lecturer. Yeah, he's very well known in biomechanics research, Dan Cleaver, Dr. Dan Cleaver. And he wrote this whole thing about squatting. And he was just like, skills versus capacities, right? It's about, can, can you actually do the skill properly? Or is it capacity? Do you lack mobility, stability? Is there a problem with the ankles, the back, etc.? And he reckons that it's never a problem with capacity or mobility. It's always a problem with skill, right? People just aren't skilled enough to squat. And he took me as an example of someone who couldn't squat. And he was trying to tell the, ho the, ho the whole cohort that I had poor skill. And then um, I was like, geez, man, I've just been squatting 150 kilos. I didn't think I was that unskilled, you know, but maybe I was skilled for the weight and for what I was doing. But the last few months, I've been doing lots of overhead squats and I've never been able to do this, never been able to front squat, overhead squat well. And now I'm doing like 80 plus overhead squatting. So maybe I'm thinking, oh, maybe it was a skill thing. You know what I mean? So like maybe I was skilled to squat that certain weight for what I was practicing, but I wasn't, I wasn't skilled to open up more mobility and stability in the right way that I should have, you know? So like for me, it's just changed my whole frame around how you teach people. You know, I, I truly believe that overhead squat will open up everything. Yeah. I mean, and would you, if you looked at somebody then now in terms of, okay, they have lack of internal rotation, external rotation, all these different mobility restrictions, but if you've got a squat, and let's let's say the squat they're doing isn't dangerous, right? It's not like, oh, we shouldn't be doing this. It's workable. Would you spend, A, would you spend just a lot of time in the early stages doing a lot of squats to try and build that skill pattern? Or then, two, would you spend a lot more time in lower rep range and strength phases? Because the way I'm thinking about it here, I started thinking about my bench press. And then, like, getting stuck at around about the 100 kilo mark. And at that point... Is it, is it that I'm not strong enough? Is it that my chest or my triceps isn't big enough? Is, or is it that my nervous system isn't used to holding and stabilizing the extra 105? So it, it's actually a skill of being able to control a weight bracket that's heavier than the current weight yeah. bracket that I'm looking at. 100%. But that's cool that a lot of people don't realize, especially like clients in Gen Pop and, or athletes, they don't realize that lifting heavy weights takes a lot of skill and coordination. They think that they can just lift heavy weights. And that's why start positions and all that is so important and technique, isn't it? You break down. But that's where you, you know, as the coach and your philosophy and your methods, that's where you may use, you know, overcoming methods like, you know, like, you may unrack a heavy weight more than what you can bench, or you may do, um, you know, you may use like accentuated eccentrics, like heavy on the way down, light on the way up, complex methods, right? But they're for advanced people. The basic ones are building like, you know, technique up in it and developing the skill. So it depends on where the athlete and the individual is on their, you know, you know, on their timeline of experience, right? Mm. Could you, you Go on. Go on. I, I was, I was, I was thinking that just there. Like, we, yeah. we have this thing at the moment where you know when people talk about length and range stuff being more hypertrophic, yeah. and now there's this bunch of people that are coming out and saying that all the exercise mechanics people reverse banding exercises are pointless because you should spend more time in that bottom position. I, I, I hate it when people say that because it means to me it's they don't understand exercise mechanics because if you reverse band something, the whole point is that you stick more weight on the top. Right? So it, it it doesn't change what you're lifting at the length of range. If anything, it makes it harder at the top bit too. But but that's a different argument. 
But then, if you if you if you, if you looked at the ability, what the reverse banding potentially allows you to do, would there be an argument? Let's say you're doing a uh, a mesocycle where you're focusing on um, squatting and benching, and you want to get someone used to handling heavier loads. Let's say you have squat day one where you do um, let you say you do like a heavy pause squat. Right, so you spend more time at the bottom, get the skill of being in that bottom position. A little bit like what you used to do with your warm-ups. You go down hole for five. You go down hole for ten. And then come back up. And on day two of the squat, same with the bench, you do reverse ba- heavy reverse banded squats and bench presses. Because then, not only are you probably lifting the same amount at the bottom as you were on day one, but now you've got to get used to holding more weight on your back. You've got used to stabilizing the bench because now it's heavier at the top. Like that's just off the top of my head of a use of a reverse band beyond stri- manipulating strength profiles and more getting your brain used to holding that bench. But knowing that it's not a weight you can lift here yet, but it's like priming you for your next measure. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, 100%. It's a method, it's a strategy, hmm. albeit a very advanced method and strategy. You know what I mean? Like, you know, <laughs> there's so that's the thing. There's so many methods out there, and using weights that are heavier than what you can lift, that's 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 um, super maximal loads. It's very very advanced. So would it be, be easier getting... though? Would it be easier though because it's a reverse band? Like, like if I was doing an eccentric hook or something like that, I would agree that it's a it's a much more advanced strategy. But using the reverse band in itself would make it slightly more towards the beginner because you're working with what your client has available in terms of profile rather than against it like a supermax like with your argument of supermax and eccentric chin-ups right that makes total sense because you're giving someone who can't lift their body weight 110 percent their body weight but like if if like you've got somebody on a say like a bench press and knowing they can lift more at this bit anyway so like this bit becomes kind of pointless yeah, like having that reverse band there actually is a, works with what they've got. So maybe it won't be the most beginner strategy, but I, I reckon you probably go into that more than maybe some of the other overcoming methods. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean it's a good it's a good argument. You know what I mean? And I think you know you could use that method. Yeah, definitely. I think it would probably work quite well. Yeah, mm. yeah. So, so when it comes to improving somebody's mobility, so we've mentioned a little bit about the skill aspect of this. In your mind, when you, what is it that somebody is lacking other than skill? Like, Why is somebody tight? Why does the body tighten up someone's pecs or tighten up someone's hips? Well, it's, um, you know, my, my understanding of it is it's a brain problem. It's, it's you know, you're, it's a central nervous system problem. When the brain feels that something is unstable, weak, normally between the muscle group, so a joint on either end, it will, it won't want to go there. You know, it won't want to allow it to go there and it will just create stiffness, tightness. And it, it just doesn't feel like it's safe to go into those end ranges of motion. So when you've got a brand new client, that they're, like say, let's take an average Joe sort of client that, we, that, that most of the coaches in this are probably going to have, or most people listening to this aren't coaches, probably experience. They're going to have tight rounded pecs. They're going to have tight, tight hips. They have very limited hip extension. Like, how do you approach this? Because there's a balance here between, like, you can say, right, we're going to, people, people argue that they're going to be stretching. Now, yeah, all right. But as we've said, this is a nervous system problem. If our body doesn't feel safe in a certain range, then stretching alone isn't going to be a thing that changes that. So I think we're both under agreement that strength at end ranges is the answer. Now, but when we look at this person, I could go, right, we need to get into the lower traps. We need to get into our length of pec. We need to get into uh, into the glutes. But I can't get into a lower trap when I'm like this. I can't get into um, glutes if I, my hip extension stops there. So um, like, how do you, because this is what I think you're really good at in terms of like progressing phase from phase. Like what's the order of looking at this for somebody like that? where you can actually go, right, well, I can't get into this. So one, how would I get into these muscles? Or B, what's my prep work? What's my GPP to get me there? Yeah. 
Yeah. You know what? Like, it's, it really is a difficult question to answer because this is what coaching is all about. And this is what 10, 15 years of experience, this is what people get. It's sometimes you just can't explain these things properly and put these things down into, on paper. And I'm sure like, you know, when you, when you want to teach your cohort about this sort of stuff, I bet it's quite difficult to actually put down and explain to them your philosophy of how you do these things. Because and that's what it is. It's the coach's eye, isn't it? It's the coach's experience. It's the coach's eye. And then you manipulate, tweak, and then go. Because sometimes in a session, I have a client do, say, three sets of 10. The beauty isn't in the rep range. The beauty is in every set. It's just a slight tweak or a, or a manipulation on chest position, torso position, dumbbell position, foot position, lower back position, breathing mechanics. There's just, just sometimes there's just a slight tweak depending on the individual and how they feel that day, uh, their hydration status, um, their readiness, um, you know, how the knee feels on the day. This, and, and I'm talking about like beginners all the way up to elite level athletes. They fluctuate so much every day. You have to auto-regulate things on a continual basis. And this is where every session is an assessment, so to speak. So there's not a specific way or method to use. I remember I trained a client this morning. She's got some of the craziest scoliosis I've ever seen in the spine, right? And really, really hypermobile shoulders and elbows. She was overhead squatting today. Last week, it was a pack of shite. You know what I mean? So is it skill? Is it readiness? Uh, she felt better than she did last week. You know what I mean? So oh, it's just a host of things that it could be. And then, yeah, it's just experience and knowing what to say, what to tweak. It's very difficult to put into words, really, the actual method that I use. But mm. I like to go from basic to more complicated. And I use a GPP, general prep, preparatory phase, to um, build, build out a client. So when you're looking at a GPP phase, because for, for, for people that might not really understand the terminology of what that means, yeah, like how are you looking at that? Like... Um, if someone comes in with, let's say, use that case study that I came with the guy with the hunched shoulders, it's like, how would you start to build a GPP phase for him? Yeah, so but it, like general physical preppiness, GPP phase, it encompasses a wide range of physical attributes that you want to develop. Physical capacity, whether it's a sport or, you know, early stages of training, right? As this guy who comes in, tight pecs, et cetera. But you want to do a few things. You want to, improve work capacity all right that's number one improve work capacity right which is um you know higher volumes lower intensities maybe shorter rest periods as well okay overall work capacity has to go up use variety so use a bunch of different exercise variations to expose the individual to variation okay you also control the law of accommodation which is repetitiveness of a specific exercise you create the foundation Okay, so there's a saying in sports science, maybe even in personal training, the wider the base, the bigger the peak. Okay, so we use a nice wide base, work capacity, variety, the, so you can diversify phys physical skills, strength, endurance, flexibility, coordination, uh, you know, skill, agility, whatever they need to work on. Nice wide base. And then they create a big, bigger peak, whether that's to, for, you know, a, a, an amazing physique or good health or sport performance. And of course, GPP is all about injury prevention. So they're the sort of things that we do. So if I had a guy that had tight pecs, depending on his skill level and all that sort of stuff, I might get him, I might actually get him doing some static stretching with some breath work around his training. I might, I might not straight away get him doing, you know, peck flies on a stability ball because he's, if he's a beginner, I, I, I don't think that's necessary. I think let's get him moving. Let's get him dumbbell pressing at all different angles. Let's get him pulling at all different angles, whether it's bilateral, unilateral. I don't really care at the moment. I just want to get him moving. I want to try and see how much volume he can handle. I might want him to improve his body comp. But ultimately, he does have to stretch a little bit more and breathe more and control his autonomic system. 
And then once it becomes a bit more pliable, then we can play with different strategies and methods mm-hmm. with training. Yeah. That, that's that's what I would do. So, yeah, I I I, I would I would I would certainly agree with that. And that's some of the things that you know I, I'm a big component of as well as like I, I've got like eight main movement patterns which I tend to put in every beginner's program, right? Which is going to be um, horizontal push, vertical push, uh, horizontal pull, vertical pull, uh, bilateral squatting pattern, unilateral squatting pattern, hip extension, knee flexion. Oh, look at that! I got it first time. Yeah, and yeah. Start, people are going to need a variation of all of them, and then yeah. you, then you take some of them away, and then you're going to focus on the few. And I think those are the things that are going to help people because why I look at you know, if someone wants to take away some from this, the way I personally look at mobility, I look at hip and rib cage, and then I expand out. So, yeah. so you mentioned breath work there. You mentioned stretching, but it's like stretching all that will essentially do is calm the nervous system down and temporarily give you a little bit more range than you had before if i stretch my hips if i stretch my pecs and i just leave if i just do a yoga class with no mobility like no uh, end range stability work it's going to come back and this is the reason why I, like if, you, if i had to go to a mobility class i quite like you know the reformers you not know, like, like a hack squat on bands oh, uh, yeah. springs i think they are good because they very much are right we'll, we'll stretch you in a position and then we'll give you a strengthening, you know, end range drill at the end of that position. So I can see people coming out of that with actual long term change. So, and the reason why I look rib cage and pelvis and out is because our bodies will always do everything it can to make sure we can walk and we can breathe. Mm. So if our diaphragm is this m- muscle here, right, it should have you breathe in. It should come down and flatten. Rib cage should expand outwards and forward and backwards to allow the lungs to have room to expand. And as you breathe out, ribs should come down, oblique should pull that down, and then that's how it should work. But now most people, more stressed, more anxious, poor sleep, poor nutrition, they're in this chronically stressed state where they have short, shallow mouth breathing patterns where they never go through a full breath cycle. So you now have this position where from the, if you've got this rib cage that isn't moving, your scapula sit on your rib cage. If you're stuck in this downward position, you're not going to have thoracic extension. If you're stuck in this extended position, and this is what I was going wrong for years with thoracic extension. I was like, I have no thoracic extension. No, I'm stuck in thoracic extension because I've got this flared rib cage. I'm all in extension. I need to bring this down and allow myself to rotate. And that was what started to get, get a little bit of freedom with myself. So is that, that, is that a help? Yeah, hugely. Yeah. Hugely. And then, and if you, because if you look at the thoracic spine, unfortunately, I don't have a skeleton yet, but if you look yeah. at the thoracic spine, the vertebrae are much, much closer together on the thoracic than the lumbar. So the lumbar is built to extend. The thoracic doesn't really have that much room to extend. So every coach talks about, oh, you've got to have extension through the thoracic, extension, 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 extension. You've got this before the bones touch. So they're much more built for rotation. So if you free up rotation, you free up movement. Um, so, like, I'll look at that. And then if we look down, so we can see how the diaphragm now affects the upper body. Now we look at how the diaphragm now affects the lower body is that diaphragm has a fascial attachment to the hip flexor, to the psoas. So I always look at this, like imagine a guitar string and you've got an over lengthened, uh, you've got a guitar string that's over lengthened. You don't want to like try and tighten that more because it was just going to snap. You, what you want to do is create tautness to that guitar string. You actually want to shorten it to make it feel looser. If you, sh- Try to keep tightening up a, a guitar string that's already tight like by expanding it. And the same thing with the hip flex and the hamstrings. They're over lengthened rather than tight. So you want to strengthen those things. So because that diaphragm has an attachment to the psoas, we now can see issues down in the lower body. Now, when we look at that's the uh, rib cage. Now we've got the pelvis. The pelvis, a lot of people have a re- re- pelvis that's rotated forward in space, meaning we're going to have to fight to keep balance. So, either in that rotation forward to stop me falling forward, I'll extend the lumbar. Then, to stop me falling backwards, I'll flex the thoracic. On the on the downwards, if you forward bring that pelvis, you're going to see internal rotation of the femurs. So, if we don't sell our pelvis, we're constantly, our body nervous system is going haywire because we're constantly trying to keep ourselves upright. If we can get rid of that need to fight gravity and fight balance, all of a sudden the body can go, and at that point, we can now go, okay, I don't mind moving into these positions. Because if I don't, we're not thinking, if I move here, I'm going to fall on my face. Or I'm going to fall on my ass. 
And also, if, if, and try this, guys, if, if you're listening. Take a deep breath in through your nose, and you'll feel how your pelvis, as you breathe out, will open, and as you breathe in, will come in. So we're stuck in this inhalation position. We're also going to be probably be lacking external rotation. As you breathe out, you'll feel that pelvis open up. So you can see how this breath affects everything. But, but, and here's the big caveat with this. Like, breath works super interesting and has a massive ability to unlock so many of your problems. But how many breaths do we do a day? Right? It's like, problem. it's like yeah. trying to piss in the ocean and thinking, oh, I'll make it yellow. There's just too much ocean. And this is where going back to what Steve says about the GPP phase is so important because it's like, well, we're not going to outdo by breath work alone all our bad breaths. So we need to get in the gym and kind of get used to maybe breathing in positions of a deep squat, maybe having pauses at hip extension and getting the glutes and hamstrings in those positions to get stronger and breathing in those positions and maybe getting into a bottom of a press and breathing in those positions. So, so we can get stronger at these end ranges in like stretching calms and nervous down. We come down, we hold this position. Our brain goes, Oh, do you know what? We can do this. It's all right. We can relax into these positions. So it's that combination of sort of being able to deal with your autonomic nervous system and control that, as well as strengthen it when you're in that position to control it. Is that, does that time make sense? I kind of went on yeah. a big fucking mission. No, no, around no. There. no, that was good explanation. Um, and just partly on the stretching side of things, that, that's, that's partly why, you know, PNF stretching works, right? Because it manipulates the nervous system by activation and relaxation. You're just mm. saying we need to go further and make it stick for longer by then practicing strength training in those positions, correct? Yeah, and I'll tell you what, if you ever get – PNF stretching is good even if it's on your own. Like you can go on and push into a bench with your elbow or your foot or things like this. But if you've ever gone to a physio and they've done real PNF stretching, because let's mm. face it, it's your what? nervous system. You're never going to go to – you're saying you have tight hips, right? You're never going to go to the position where you really need to improve – on your own self PNF stretching. You're just going to go, that's too uncomfortable. There's no chance. But when you get somebody who literally puts their knee in front of your knee in full hip extension and goes, push against me, you have nothing, nothing. And then they'll push you further and they'll go, go again. And you have even less. It's a humbling experience, but one that's game changing. I got a physio uh, once a week because uh, we had a, a deal with the gym below us in Hong Kong. And I'll tell you what, I miss. Uh, shout out to Liz. Um, miss her because I'll tell you what, I left those sessions feeling so much better. Yeah. And this is it. This is a big key. Like, if you do something, anyone listening, if you're doing something and you feel it's helping, you relax, you feel better, by all means, carry on doing that because that's very, very powerful. And 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 this is the thing, like I've the last two weeks I've been doing a lot of static stretching just in front of the TV, hanging in positions, but my back's been so sore. Whereas one of my clients, she stretches every night and she feels amazing and she feels great. So I'm like, you know what? I don't care if it's working or not. If you're feeling better doing that and it gives you more confidence to move, run, walk, train, try things, by all means, continue doing it. Confidence is a key word as well, right? Because as you said, it's skill related. So if you don't feel confident in the move, you're not going to do the skill. And if you don't do the skill, you don't get confident in these end positions. And you don't do these end positions, you don't actually reinforce these patterns. And I think that's, that's such a, a key aspect that people don't think about. And you said earlier on, it's hard to articulate it because it's, people are going to come in feeling different every day. I remember a woman who literally, she could deadlift 130 one day, like, Trap by deadlift, perfect, like beautiful. And I she, don't know what it was, just stress at work or life or just stuff that beat, beat her down. She'd come in the next day and I've completely forgotten how to deadlift. And I'm talking Wednesday to Friday. I've never seen anything like it. And like, she hasn't lost the skill. It's just her nervous system is so flustered that she can't think about anything. It's not just the deadlift. The deadlift happens to be the medium which we're looking at right now and the lens we're looking at this through. And you look at pain. We had Nick Daniel doing a guest speaker chat um, last week, which was unreal. But he talks about pain as being something that's unlearned. People have pain longer than they have an injury. And it's so a lot of it's like, well, you need to be able to get confidence doing the pattern that caused the pain in the first place if you ever really want to get rid of the pain. 
when you look at things like pain, you also can be looking at nutrient deficiencies. You could be looking at inflammation. So I, I, I get back pain. My back pain gets worse when I eat like rubbish. Whereas when I'm eating well and dieting, I tend to lose back pain. And I don't think about it until I start eating crap again and go, oh, why did I start ruining myself again? <laughs> But like, so these, these, these things are super complicated, but I think it's, yeah. I think the big thing like you mentioned there, it's like having that coaching eye and that ability to understand some level of mechanics to go and go, right. If I have someone that's got knee pain, the struggles to go into or ankle pain and he can't go into um, as much dorsiflexion, I could either go, well, we won't squat or I could go, well, let's go low bar. Or rather than having someone who's got an SI joint problem and say, well, okay, we won't deadlift. Let's go sumo, which will lock in those SI joints. And if you can change the, the, like the moment arms of an exercise to be in a position where we're not actually causing as much discomfort, but keep the patterns in place, then you're probably going to find it's going to be less of a backward step to kind of go through those and to, to come back and start squatting again. And you're going to have less pain than if you went, no, we're never going to squat and deadlift for the next six weeks. And now they're terrified of it. Like, it, like mobility is such a – everyone talks about stretching and semantics and yoga and Pilates and like end range mobility and PNF stretching. And people don't think, well, actually, let's look at the brain. Like, what's your life like? Are you sleeping? Is your nutrition good? Is your life good? Is your missus kicking your ass? Like, what is the stuff here? I, I think that's the big key as well because, like, whether it's soft tissue work from a physio, whether it's, you know, an aggressive technique like gaucha, whether it's dry needling, whether it's um, foam rolling, whether it's static stretching, dynamic stretching, breath work, essentially you're manipulating the nervous system and you've got to find what works for you and then you've got to use it in the correct me way to get the benefit, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, interesting. Yeah. Like Nick, Nick Daniel said to me recently, he says, I'm setting up soon in London. Do you need any work done? And for the first time in my life, I went, I don't think I do. <laughs> and, and, and what's changed? The only thing that's really changed is I'm a little bit more relaxed since moving back to the UK. There that's the go. only thing that's changed. Like, do you know, I'm, yeah, I'm not going to be overhead squatting tomorrow. But, like, I don't feel sore. I don't feel as stiff. I am stiff. But, like, I don't feel it. Like I, I, I just like right. I just need to get in the gym and just continue doing this work, and it. So I, that was a big moment for me because I was like, oh, I've never said that to a physio. I've always leaped at the chance because I've always needed something. I could still and, benefit from something, but I've never needed it. And you know what's mad about that? Like you're probably sitting down way more than you ever have before. Yeah. In a compromised position that we tend to think you know isn't healthy for you. You know what I mean? So um, interesting. <laughs> Like, I forgot what I was going to say there. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. So I, I, th I think I think that's the big takeaways of this. It's like, and you, you mentioned breathwork stuff. Then let's let's get, let's leave people with some tools to actually work on. So you mentioned you would give some people some stretching, and you give people some breathwork tools. What are you go to tools for people to do as homework that can sort of bring in bring this stuff into place? So um, I think. Static stretching with breath work combined can be beneficial for some people. Okay. My, my, my thought process on that has changed. I think that can be beneficial for some people just to help them relax, calm the body, calm the nervous system. So that could be hit three of the big basic muscle groups. It could be, um, it could be glutes and quads and hips. Yeah. And just hang out in a couch stretch, hang out in a piriformis stretch, those two. And um, just hang out for 60 to 90 seconds and just deep breathe. So they piriformis may... being the 90-90? Yeah, it could be 90-90 or it could be leg up on bench, on an incline bench mm. or leg up on a flat bench, a bit more aggressive. Um, so any of those stretches, um, I like those. And just hang out for anywhere between 60 to 90 seconds or 120 seconds. Just hang out in front of the TV. I can't see that being a problem for you unless you don't feel great doing that but breath work important as well two three up to five minutes of breath work that could be all by itself laying on your back it could be um laying prone face down with a ball on the tummy or on the hip flexors 
So you're getting a little bit of soft tissue aggressive work in those areas as well. Mm. They're the sort of things I do with breath work. So you mentioned you, 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 you changed your mind on it. What did you change your mind on? Well, um, I never used to like static stretching. But Why so? Just my, you know, my experience doing static stretching, I would feel good, but then I would feel more stress and niggles the following day. So maybe I was stretching too long, stretching too aggressively. I'm already too tight. But a lot of my clients do a static stretching and they find it helps them. They feel better. So, you know, like some people, it may be good. Some people it may be bad. Depends on if they're injured or not. Like I have a client who stretches every night and he's had a back pain for ages. So I'm trying to tell him, listen, maybe you need to stop stretching where someone else has got a few niggles stretch more they feel better doing it so you know i think it is you know client dependent whether they like to stretch or not whether they can relax in those positions again it's like you know do they feel relaxed are they breathing whilst they're doing these stretches do you think there's an element though of like it depends on sort of how much the benefit of stretching is for that person so for example you a person for for what you need squat bench dead overhead press maybe overhead squat you can get into these positions without really doing that much warm-up so you get in you can get the bar on your back you can just start squatting so for you stretching now going back to what we said at the start of that mobility stability continuum that took you away from the stability more towards that mobility side of this the equation which means you're picking up more niggles because whereas now you're locked and stable in that movement pattern and now you're starting to get yourself in a more unstable pattern Whereas your client who really benefits from stretching, they couldn't do the pattern and the problem was the fact of the mobility restriction. So yes. them stretching more just gets them to baseline, whereas you, it takes you away from baseline. Yes, and that's where it's skills versus capacities driven. So if they can't do the skill, then that's one thing. They need to practice the skill. However, if they lack the capacities, whether that's like, you know, the, the movement and the flexibility, then that's what they need to work on. Yeah, more stretching, etc. But you know, like saying that, you know, sleep is very pivotal as well. You know, like if you sleep less than eight hours a night, your risk of injury goes up by one point seven times. So, sleep is a massive contributor to injuries, mobility. That's because it how it plays a role on the nervous system, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it, like I was thinking when you were talking about the stretching stuff, I was like, what do I eat? now recommend having gone through that physio stuff and it's like for me it's like how can i combine so i think my first part is pnf static stretching and breath work like you're saying i quite like breath work against the wall where i can bring my arms forward and have a reach to take out the pecs take out the traps and think about expanding back into the wall if you can do it with a balloon even better because then you can get a big long exhale and you can try and blow up that balloon but my next stage of that it's like how do i get that from being just a static stretch and this is where a lot of people go wrong. You're static stretch for years. How do I get from being a static stretch to being in a position where I can um, start to make this active? So a couple of things I would say is like, well, how do I like, well, taking that 90-90 stretch you did for an example, could I now in that 90-90 hinge for reps? And then could I hold that last hinge, going back to your breath work, for like five to 10 deep breaths. So you're in an end range position. You're not relaxing into a passive stretch. You're literally holding just off that bottom position. Could I do that? Or could I go into a, a, a hip stretch, like a, a couch stretch, but both feet on the floor, holding onto a couple of yoga blocks and actually moving the back knee up and doing reps of that? Like, how do I now get into position where I'm moving through these end ranges rather than just statically pushing myself into end ranges? Yeah, I think, and I think that was a big game changer for me. Yeah, I, I think that's a uh, massive, you know, like to do those sort of techniques and move through the positions. I say like static stretching, but there's a big element of moving through those positions as well in there, you know, like mm. like you said, you know, um, functional range conditioning and those sort of methods as well. Mm. Cool. So I think I think that takes us to our 45 minutes, man. It's good to get you back on the show. For that's people good. who want to find you, because you've been doing more online coaching recently, so people might listen to this and go, I want to contact Steve from... Azerbaijan, where can 
you know, Pedro from Aj- is Pedro even an Azerbaijanian name? Pedro from Azerbaijan contact you. Is Pedro on your um, viewers list? Is he? Um, Absolutely, no, you- mate. Yeah, I, I, I have, I have. Do you know what I realised the other had a look at this? I have viewers. My top ten countries on the podcast is not what it used to be. If I can find where my phone is, I'd show you what they are because I took a picture of it, um, which I annoyingly can't. But it was like Austria in there. Uh, it yeah. wasn't just the UK and Hong Kong. America was number two. Australia was number three, I think. Cool. Yeah, yeah it's changed. Yeah, now you can find me at Stephen Collins Training website, socials, all the same. Check it out. Always putting content up for people. And uh, yeah, obviously do online coaching. So if you want to work with me, just hit me up. Let me know. Awesome, guys. And as ever, if you enjoy the show and if you got this far, we'd really appreciate it if you could subscribe to the channel, share on your social media platforms. The bigger the show gets, the bigger the guests get, and the better value for you guys. So if you've got to this this part of the show and you've listened to us for 45 minutes, you clearly like what we're chatting about. So just we're giving you this away every week for free. So in return, all I ask is a share and a subscribe. If you do that, love you forever. All right, guys. Peace. Awesome.